everyone, this is Yano Alex and who are watching the Mongols podcast. I'm also known as Samwise J. More Concern, and this right here is my friend Robin. Hi! Good to hear, and, well, sadly we can't get a hold of Jay Burke today. Lots of sad reacts on that one. <laughs> but anyways, um, <laughs> as kind of a preliminary disclaimer warning, we, while the Mongols are exceptionally brutal, this... This is going to be extra brutal. Like, ready your puke bags. Yeah, ready. This takes like, like, uh, uh, like blood, guts, war, death, carnage. You know, all that fun stuff. It, it just takes to a whole new level. Oh yeah, yeah. This is going to be episode four: <laughs> Pyramids of Skulls and Life of Tamerlane. You can say it's pretty sick. I. <laughs> good one. Good one. Good one. <laughs> so. So, but first, before we get into it, so, to some extent, I want to address why we're talking about Tamerlane, because keep in mind, one of the big things here is, like, he's probably our first protagonist that is technically not related to Jack Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of interesting, because, like, we've had everybody related to Genghis Khan at this point. Yeah. And, well... He can claim as much as he wants, but technically, the ancestry does not match up. So, sorry, Timor. <clears throat> so, so why are we talking about him? Well, he he's very much taking up the whole Mongols and uh, Mongols as Genghis as like what he's going to model his life after, what he wants, what we, he wants to be in life, the greatest world conqueror. He wants to take over the entire world and outdo and outdo Genghis. That's kind of a shpick, that's kind of a shpick, and that's kind of why we're talking about him. So, but don't worry, that doesn't mean that Genghis's family is actually out of the picture yet. They're, they're very much still here. They're just, they're just forced to be side characters now. Which is definitely a weird role. Yeah. Definitely one role they're not going to be content with. <laughs> Nobody ever is. <laughs> nope, yeah, no. Well, I mean, I don't think I'd mind being a side character, because that means that I probably won't die. I thought the main characters had all the plot armor. Well, yeah, but, like, think about Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> Good point. Like, like, uh, Romeo's ex? She actually survives the friggin' play. Yeah, well... Partly because she's uh, on a good thing to a nunnery sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. Yay to those. Uh, yay to that kind of stuff. <laughs> Nunneries, known for saving girls from teenage hormones. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, back to back to Timor. So Timor is born to uh, this very obscure Turkish chieftain over in modern day Uzbekistan, known as Taragi Noyan. And and his mom is Takina Katun. That means he technically it does have Mongol ancestry, but we really, but despite his claims, we can't really confirm whether he's related to Genghis. So he's so that kind of makes him sad because the thing with being related to Genghis is that only relatives of Genghis can be named Khan, or at least Great Khan. So. He's kind of barred for life from that position, despite the fact that his and, and despite the fact that he's probably done everything that he could to earn it, minus that. Oh. Oof. But either way, he uh, like the book I read for this was uh, *Tamerlane: The Ultimate Warrior* by Roy Steer. Very good book, by the way. And it often describes like very early on, like like this whole stuff of like people prophesizing him coming around and. Mm, and like he is mentioned in um, the local prophecy book, which is known as, please excuse my pronunciation, Majumu Nafai Akrum Anudzunum. I don't know. Uh, uh, my, oh, wow. That, That's no. a message. Of text. <laughs> yeah. Also, it translates apparently from uh, the local tongues to predictions of the stars. So, yeah, that's kind of the idea. So they're like. <laughs> They were, like, checking the signs when uh, Timor was born, and they were like, holy crap, this kid's going to do a lot of stuff. <laughs> so it's but... horoscopes. Basically. <laughs> yeah, and they were like, this kid's going to do a lot of great stuff because the stars say so. And I'm just like, well, I don't know, maybe he just wrote that up after the fact. Oh, 
because because like, that's kind of the thing with prophecies that they only come true because either people a comes true after the fact or people make it true come make it come true anyway so oh yeah at least that's the way prophecies usually work in real life yeah so aka they don't <laughs> <laughs> and one of the later titles that is going to come up a lot later in this podcast is he's going to be known as Saqib Kiran, which is supposed to be like Persian for Master of the World. And apparently this was a title that they that people were even trying to pass on to people like Alexander the Great. So, yeah, he's got a lot of role models and a lot of people that he wants to live up to. That's kind of, that's kind of Timur's big shtick. But he's kind of born into a into a fairly poor a fairly, a fairly poor tribe. He's from some sort of off brand nobility that probably hasn't been doing well ever since well the Mongols. No one's so, been doing well since the Mongols, except the Mongols, and even then they're not doing well either. <laughs> Too true. And one of the and he's actually spending some of his early years growing up as a shepherd. But also, in the meantime, he's stacking up his skills as a warrior, learning how to shoot from horseback and all that jazz. Mm -hmm. And I mean, by the time he reaches his teenage years, he's actually tutored over at his grandpa's house. He becomes super smart. He learns all this, like, grand history stuff. He learns Persian, the Turkish language, the Mongol language. He doesn't learn to speak Arabic, though, which is kind of weird because he is converted to because he's converted to Islam very early on. So, there you go. That's it's kind of strange a bit, but there you go. And in the meantime, and he's growing up uh, and so right around uh, 1330, and, and, and right around the 1340s. He's actually born specifically like in Kesh in 1336, so there you go. He's born in Kesha? Kesh. Not, no relation to the singer. Okay. I know. It's weird. And after all that, he's, and he's noticing, and near Kesh is actually this very important city, Samarkand. Samarkand is kind of known as like the big, as kind of known as the big city down there. It's sort of a local capital. And this city actually is very old, goes all the way back to Alexander the Great, who actually founded the city and characteristically named it after himself. Alexandria Escape, which is supposed to be like Alexandria far to southeast. Oh. Yeah, that's Alexander the Great. Name 20 cities after yourself and then name one after your horse. Okay, but come on. That's like... Yeah, I'd do that <laughs> if I were Alexander the Great. Indeed, indeed. And then they all drop the name or it can disintegrate into ruins. It's kind of hilarious, Alexander. <laughs> Maybe you should like Spend more time city building and not burning cities. Lessons learned. And one, and the big thing is like the the local rulers, the sultan, the emirs of Samarkand are not all that powerful. They're basically like jokes. They're just they have a little bit of power in the city, but like nobody actually says yes to them. So it's kind of hilarious. So it's like they're like like a gang. That's just kind of like, like, you're like, oh, look at you. And look at you trying to form a gang. And here's some cookie kids. Now go play. <laughs> yeah, and that's basically what the real guy in charge is doing around here. His name is Amir Kazagan. And so he's technically in charge. If you're wondering where the cons are, it's... It's the, it's kind of... That's kind of one of the big uh, phenomenons around the Mongols. It's like... They're caring less about, like, how much power the Khan has, even though he's supposed to have a bunch load of power. So, there you go. And... So, the Khan's, like, the Queen of England? Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> and Timur really likes what Kazagan is doing because he's like, I wish I had that kind of power. Oh, wait, I will someday. Don't you worry. And... <clears throat> And one and one and the sultan and like the sultan or emir of Samarkand really, he's a he's a, a kind of douche and he's trying to take more power. So Kazakhan's like, we need new management. So I'm gonna just kill him here. Just casually pushes, just casually pushes the uh, sultan down the steps and he's like, 
Um, I need a new. I, I need somebody new in charge of Samarkand. Um, oh hey, um, you happen to be the send for Genghis Khan? Cool, you got the job. Am I actually going to be doing anything? You really think so? <laughs> mm, I'm guessing the answer is no. Correct. <laughs> so that sounds, that sounds nice. So he's like hired onto the job, doesn't actually do anything, and Kazagan continues to be in charge for a little while longer. And so, like, and but Timur is still preeminent. He's being he still has his parents, so that's good. His dad's not getting poisoned. Oh well, yeah, that's that's good. <laughs> Thank goodness for that. And eventually, Timur maxes up enough skills and joins the and joins Kazagan's army as a scout and. He starts learning a lot from him, and they and they kind of do a lot of good stuff together. They're just it's kind of probably might remind some longer listeners of the podcast of the relationship between uh and, and between uh, Genghis Khan and his mentor uh, Togro uh, Togro Khan. It might remind some people of that, but all good things eventually come to an end, and not too long after uh, and not too long after. Uh, Timur marries his first wife. He uh, uh, Kazagan actually just dies. Oh, okay. Of natural causes, kind of leaves his stuff to his kids. This is already gonna go downhill very quickly, and the kids are all kind of fighting, and the and they're also trying to buy for uh, buy for friendship from Timur. And he's kind of, but he's kind of like, I'm gonna just kind of watch her. And then he claims to support the guy who finally comes out on top. And then just as that guy comes out on top, the Mongols invade. Because, like, technically, these guys aren't part of the Mongol Empire. Or, or at least that part, much part of the Mongol Empire. Because the Chakotai Khanate hasn't been doing all that much. Even though they're the guys technically in charge. And... As soon as the and as soon as they and as soon as the the models from Chagatai Khanate invade, Timur's like, "Hey, um, can I join? I hear you guys uh, offer some good jobs here, and I could really help administrate the region down here. I've been kind of a little bit in charge with my own band of warriors." And they're like, "Um, wait, but didn't you just used to work for those guys that we just invaded?" Yes, and they sent me here to negotiate with you, but I'm still gonna change sides anyway. So yeah, talk about betrayal. <laughs> and the, all the descendants of <laughs> Kazagan are like, "We trusted you, Timor," Ooh. and they're like, "And Timor's like, I always wanted to do my own thing. I always wanted to be in charge, and that didn't include you guys." So he, and so he's set up by the and by the Chagatai by Togla Khan, who is ruling over the Chagatai Khanate at this time. So he's officially in charge, but he's officially in charge. But of course, he'd like more because why not? Yeah. And over the next few and over the next few years, like Togla Khan and his descendants succumb to the classic uh, classic Genghis problem of drinking. And they let Timur do more and more administration and ruling. So technically, Timur isn't calm, but do you need to be calm when you're technically in charge anyway? No. Exactly. <laughs> so with uh, so with all, so with all the stuff in the east covered up, at least for now, he decides that he would like to expand. But before that, he has to get shot in the knee. Ah. <laughs> so while he's actually doing his time as a time as a time as a raider, he he's trying to steal some sheep, and the raid doesn't go all that well in the sense of like the shepherd actually gets a little extra security and uh, shoots Timur twice in the le- one in the leg and one on his arm. And these wounds actually never heal. That's where he actually becomes known as Timur the Lame or Timur Lang or Tamar Lame. So really taking the arrow to the knee. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so, 
so yeah he so he, he and this is all around the 1360s and he and he's slowly racking up his stuff and he's consolidating and then he look and then he's looking down and it's like hey what's happening with persia here and the persia and persia's like we're in a complete and utter state of chaos Nothing is good around here. We're out of cons, or we have a bunch of kingdoms that can't agree on who's in charge. It's bad. So, if we're wondering what exactly happened there, well, in short order, let's just say the plague happened. The plague got to everyone, including the Ilkhanate, with, who were the descendants of Huleku, and Khan, the brother of Kublai that showed up last episode. So, they're out of the picture, and basically nobody is agreeing on who's in charge, and Timur's like, now this looks like a job for me. Oh my lord! <laughs> so he goes down there, and he <clears throat> so he goes down there with his Mongols and Turks, and he starts laying waste to basically anybody who says no to him. Oh, f- f- fun! And he, and he keeps on winning battle after battle, taking city after city, and some cities surrender, some cities don't, and those cities that don't get burnt to the ground, and. Basically, everybody's dead, but, like, the artisans and bureaucrats who are all taken back to Samarkand, which is basically, like, <laughs> which is basically, like, Timur's favorite city. He's got his capital there, and he's like, yes, let's make my capital more beautiful. Oh, more beautiful. Can I add another building here? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so he keeps, uh, so he just keeps on going, and. He, he, so he keeps on going as he's ruling Samarkand, and and one of the other things is that he finally racks up, a, as he's ruling Samarkand, he finally racks up his final bits of legitimacy. You see, one of the people that he managed to overthrow before he took Samarkand officially was uh, the guy in charge at the time, Amir Hussein. And Hussein happened to be married to Mukhamun. Sorry if I butchered the pronunciation. <laughs> and Mulkamun happens to be a descendant of Genghis Khan, so that's where Timur's like, yes, finally some sweet legitimacy. <laughs> that's, that's, that's me whenever my, uh, my emotions are validated by people around me. So, yay. So he has some sweet legitimacy, and he's like, this is good. So what else is new? Persia's in a state of chaos? Okay, gotta go conquer that. <laughs> so, he takes everything, he takes, uh, he, he, he takes all the cities, he takes Baghdad, he sets it in a little bit, and, but, what, uh, but while he's doing all this stuff and racking up his power, a refugee kind of runs into his court asking for a quick apartment for a few days and maybe a couple of guys to do some things, and this, and this kid happens to be Tuktamish. Tokhtamish is another descendant of Genghis Khan, and he's specifically from the Khanate of the Golden Horde, so that means he's descended through Jochi's law. And he, and if you're wondering why he isn't in charge, well, that's because the Golden Horde isn't actually doing too hot. Oh? Like, it's sort of, it's sort of split in two. Oh. Like, two branches of uh, Jochi's family are basically duking it out. It's known as the Blue Horde and the White Horde. And, like, Tokamish's dad was in charge of the White Horde. Mm-hmm. And he tried taking on the guy of the Blue Horde. He got killed in battle. And Tokamish was forced to flee as a result. This is around 1376, just as, uh, and just as uh, Timur is running up, <clears throat> just consolidating his base and... I'm racking up some, racking up some raiding points over in Persia, and he gives to uh, to Tamish some soldiers to just kind of say, "Okay, I guess you want your land back." And after a little, and after a little bit of going nowhere, to Tamish finally manages to take control of Russia. Just Russia? Well, mostly because well, he he takes over his dad's old white horde, he conquers up the blue horde, and. He's like to Russia, um, you gotta say yes to me, and the Russians are like, no, and then he's like, great, so that means I get to besiege Moscow. Wait, what? Since when? Yeah, I'm gonna keep on pillaging you guys until you say yes to me. All right, fine. It's like, 
Okay, that's cool. And in the meantime, he's finally finished up his conquest of Persia. And and and, and he's also got Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, basically like all the sands are saying yes to him. Oh. So I guess that's good for him. You that's that's the plan, Stan. <laughs> Indeed. And with that, at the end of it all, he's he's got all his territory, but then he notices something. So Tamish isn't exactly the best of friends. Specifically, Tuktamish is kind of falling along the lines of his great ancestor, Genghis, and he wants to conquer more things. Oh. But now that... But now he's turning the idea of... But now Tuktamish wants to go south and conquer Timur's territory. So he starts invading some of Timur's territory and getting a little close to Samarkand, and... Timur's like, dude, I thought we were friends. You're going to betray me anyway. Oh. All right, you asked for this. Cruel. <laughs> so, Tim so Timur grabs his armies and he shows up straight to mm -mm, straight to Tuktamish's place and he's like, I'm going to wreck your stuff. Bring it on. And they meet for battle and Tuktamish does not feel great. He absolutely gets slammed at the... I actually forgot the battle name, but whatever. So, point is, Tukamish got slammed. He got beaten really badly. And so... And so Timur conquers whatever territory he lost. And he starts advancing a little bit into Russia, but he's like... Wait a second. Um, urgent message from Baghdad. It's in revolt. Ah, oh, oh, gosh darn gosh. it. Oh, great. I'm going to have to do that. Deal with that again. All right, took Tamish another day. I got to see about Baghdad and a bunch of other cities. So he goes down there. He takes care of Baghdad again. And what I mean by taking care, he burns it to the ground. So, ow. <laughs> wow. And then he moves back up and he's like, hey, took Tamish, did you miss me? No, I didn't. I don't want to see you again. Well... Sorry, you're seeing me again, and actually I'm seeing you off your throne. So he so he just marches up through the Golden Horde, he actually wrecks everything. And he deposes Tokamish and actually occupies Moscow for about a year. Oh. But everything's up in revolt again. So naturally Timor has to go down south, but at least Tokamish is tied up. Like, he's not taken a prisoner, but he's out of power. And he's basically going to be kind of the, a little bit of a runaway side character for now. Oh, okay. At least for, like, the next decade, because eventually he's going to die. Oh, well, yeah. He's going to get killed oh. while he's trying to take his throne back. He never gets back in charge again, if you're wondering. So, oh. there goes that guy. Yeah, bye-bye. <laughs> So with so with that loose end tied up, uh, Timur has to go and sack some more cities. And while he's sacking it, and while he's sacking the cities, are up in revolt. And he also has to go to war against Egypt and the Ottoman Empire because they were actually funding the rebels, and also insulting Timur's manliness, uh, especially um, especially uh, the Ottoman Sultan who was like. I'm going to have a royal amount of sex with your wife. And Timur's like, oh, you did not just oh say that to me. Gosh. You're not going to steal. I mean, like, I have, like, eight wives at this point. I probably lost count. But you're not banging any of my girls, all right? Oh, my gosh. So I'm going to I'm gonna really bust you wide open. But first, let's shut up Egypt first. So he shows up to Egypt, which is ruled by the Mamluks. These are the same guys that beat the Mongols at Ain Jalut last podcast. And he sacks Aleppo and Damascus. And and, and Egypt is like, this is fine. This is fine. Our cities are on fire, but this is fine. They're going to turn to the Ottomans eventually, considering all those stupid letters. And now well, Timur predictably does. And he shows up to the Ottomans and he's like, Hello, I'm going to kill you guys. I'm super crazy. So, um, surrender? If you still want your lives? 
And the Ottomans are like, oh, come on. We can totally take you guys, right? Oof. We'll just set and and Timur is allowed to advance deep in, deep into Turkey while the while the Ottoman Turks are marshal are marshaling their forces because at this point in time the Ottomans have been besieging Constantinople for a good long while and that's where their occupation was and now that Timur is invading they need to transport their forces to fight Timur. And they finally meet at Ankara, which is about uh, Western Turkey. That's kind of the current capital of the nation right now. And they fight, and they fight this vicious battle. It's it kind of goes a bit back and forth, but eventually, Timur comes out on top, and he basically kills a whole bunch of Turks, and he captures the and captures the Sultan Bayezid. And this is an absolutely massive blow to the Ottoman Empire because at this point, Bayezid hasn't designated who's going to be in charge because he's expecting kind of, a, I'm a young and vibrant conqueror and not going to have to worry about this stuff for now. Cue him getting captured. Yeah, ooh. His sons actually get away, but now they're fighting over who gets the empire. And Timur's like, I'm just going to finish up a little bit here and... um head back, I've probably got a rebellion to put down somewhere. Also, I want to keep on working on Samarkand and make it more beautiful. So he's going to go back there and he's going to found some more universities, get some, and get some moss up. He, he designs a bunch of lavish tombs for some of the kids he outlived, sadly. Ooh. Yeah, he's been losing a lot of kids over the years. Yeah. Like, his first son, Jahangir, actually died when Jahangir was only 20. So, there you go. Like, died of the... Like, he died of some disease or something like that, and that's not good. And that meant, like, his first heir is down the drain, and then he had to set up another heir. That would be uh, Jahangir's old son, Muhammad Sultan. And Muhammad Sultan also dies. He actually dies of battle wound shortly after the fight at Ankara, and and basically, like, Timur was pleading with, was pleading with the Sultan, was pleading with the doctors to make sure that, like, is my kid okay? Is my grandkid going to be okay? Is my grandkid going to be okay? And he's like, "Sorry, no, 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 no fam, he did." <laughs> and he's like, "Well, that's bonkers." God damn it! Now I got to find another kid. <laughs> Indeed, and he actually doesn't find another kid for a good long while. I mean, he's been having a lot of kids, so he's got a lot of kids to choose from, but some of them are more qualified than others. Some of that old rampant alcoholism problem, he has to, like, imprison one of his sons over that. Ooh. Yeah. Apparently Greek conquerors love beer. Or yeah. wine, or whatever is going on yeah, down there. Yeah, yeah. You know, alcoholic beverages. Oh, yeah, and actually just... I actually totally forgot about this, don't know how I did, but... He also figured, but also uh, Timur figured out that he should probably also invade India. Oh, mm -hmm. so I so. But before we do that, we need to kind of brief you guys on the situation of like why Timur wants to invade India. It's not just that India hasn't been paying tribute, because Mongols love it when people pay tribute because it means that we don't have to kill you. But India also is actually being dominated by this Muslim empire known as the Delhi Sultanate, which is actually under rule of the Tughlaq dynasty. And the Tughlaq dynasty has kind of been a bit moderate with the Hindu subjects who are non-Muslim, non-Christian. They're not people of the book. And that's kind of a problem for Muslim, for Muslim rulers like Timur. And he's like, bro, why are you treating the Hindus so nicely? Also, can I get a job as the caliph? Dude, we've been out of Caliph since Mongols sacked Baghdad. Ow. Well, I need to do more stuff to be the sword of Islam. But you're still killing Muslims. Yeah, I know. But they're all opposing me. All right, we'll just call your prince of destruction. <laughs> so that's the kind of stuff that Timur gets has stuck with. He's known as the prince of destruction because he's just killing so many people. And finally, like, and so Timur basically on the idea of you're not tracing the Hindus terribly enough invades India. And he shows up at Delhi is like, hey, 
want to surrender? And the, and, and the Indian Sultan is like, no, here's my army. I have this army full of infantry and everything, and do you have horsemen? Not too many. Do you have elephants? Oh, a whole bunch. Poison spikes, male armor, and all. Ooh, says Timur to himself. I'm gonna like this. I'm gonna get really inventive and very sadistic. So the so like one of the traditional Indian ta tactics, uh, Indian tactics is like they're going to send the elephants into the field and uh, to try to scare everyone mm -hmm. because they know that uh, the Indian uh, the Indian soldiers are used to the elephants, but nobody else is. So as they send in the elephants first to take in, uh, to soak up all the damage and frighten everyone, and Timor knows this. Because he's read up on his history books, like he studied Alexander and everybody who fought in elephants, and he comes up with his own very cruel way of dealing with the elephants. And so first he, um, so first he plans out his plan B, which is dig a, tr um, which is put some space between his army and the elephants by digging a giant line of trench. So he digs a trench, and then he starts, and then he gathers up his supply camels. And he starts stacking, um, and he starts stacking large bales of hay onto them. And then he grabs a torch and lights the hay, and then he sends the camels screaming into the elephants. Oh no! And the camels are burning out, and it's like, what is happening to me? I don't want to die in fire. Oh gosh, I'm being, I'm being driven into this giant line of elephants. It's not like I liked elephants anyway. And the elephants are like, what is going on there? What is this raging wall of fire and death coming towards me? Oh, gosh, it's the camels. Oh, God, they're on fire. What we're facing up against is crazy. We got to run. Unfortunately, the problem with the elephants is that they're running straight into the Indian army. <laughs> so all the so when all the Indian army is trampled and gored and it's all massacred by their own elephants. Wow. And Timur's just like, yeah, that's how I deal with elephants. It's bloody, but I did it. <laughs> and this is all before he messed up with the Ottoman Empire, so he's got he's got some big kill counts. And he finally shows up to Delhi and is like, let's turn that kill count up another. How can we? Hey, um, soldiers, do would you guys like raises? Yes, we would like raises. I'll give you a raise for every person whose head you cut off. And at the end of it all, like, the whole city is massacred and burnt to the ground, and suddenly people are looking around, whatever is left of them, and it's like, where are these new structures? Oh, God. That pyramid of skulls. Is that even my granddad anymore? That's just brutal. Dude, Why? You, you didn't pay tribute, people. This is what happens when you say no to me. So he does... Uh, uh, so, he, uh, so he sacks Italy, and then he goes off and takes care of the Ottomans. And he's... Uh, and then he... Uh, and he conquers up a little bit more in, in near India. And then he makes another uh, brash decision to try to emulate his idol, Genghis Khan. Because he likes doing that kind of stuff. And he's like, I'd like to invade China today. I'd like to walk into Beijing and slaughter more people and be the prince and be the son of heaven. But wait, the Chinese are in charge of China. Wait, since when? <laughs> yeah, they kicked out Kublai Khan's kids ages ago. They've been under new management and they really like being under Chinese management and not, you know, being ruled by Mongols and Turks because they're kind of crap. And drinking too much and not doing enough work. So, like, in the sense, well, that's not entirely the case. Like, in the sense, like, the Mongols, uh, um, the Mongols were a slight bit hands off when it came to administration. Not entirely hands off, though. They would just basically set up, <laughs> they would basically just find the right guys, set them up in charge, and kind of let those guys do their own things. But if that guy rebelled, or did some, or did some corrupt things to try to slink and slink in some extra money. Well, there goes your head. Ooh, that's 
So Timur, so the year is about 1403, and Timur's writing up everything. He's got his guns, his horses, he's got his trebuchets and all that stuff, and he's preparing to invade China. And he starts crossing the Himalayas, and when and winter hits, and apparently, his camping list did not include cough syrup because that wasn't invented yet. So he catches a cold. Catches a cold in the cold? Yeah, and he does not survive that cold. And keep in mind, during this whole time, he hasn't actually designated an heir yet. Ever oh. since he lost Muhammad Sultan oh. at the Battle of Ankara, so it's like, who's in charge now? Um, Timur, got any ideas? Are you still there? Um, barely. Um... That that my grandson, uh, he had a brother, right? Yeah, let's put him in charge. Sure, he'll he'll do something, right? Right? <laughs> um, so he <laughs> so he installs his grandson, Pure Muhammad, who happens to be the brother of Muhammad Sultan, and he's like, okay, I'm gonna go and die now. But at least unlike most of Mongol Mongol rulers, he actually leaves behind his body and a tomb so we can like do autopsies on him and actually that that mausoleum the mausoleum his mausoleum over in Samarkand was actually excavated by the Russians in uh, 1941. Oh. Oh fun. Yeah and apparently uh, don't entirely quote me on this I think I'm just recalling a bad documentary and they and apparently when the, when the Soviets were investigating uh, Timur's tomb they've found this, like, little curse. Like, if you defile my tomb, bad things will happen, sort of thing. Sort of like what they would say on Today Comet's tomb as well. Yeah. And, and, of course, somebody, conspiracy theories, like, and then the Nazis invade, like, a few months later. Well, who'd have thunk? You, you, you invaded the wrong place, and now you pay the price. And I'm just like, Dude, that's totally not how it happened. Yeah, the Nazis were totally going to invade Russia anyway, regardless of whether the Russians touched Timur's tomb. Yep. Because, well, Nazis like Laban. Uh, le- Nazis like the extra living space for the master race. Mm. I... So, th- th- uh, but, of course, the story's not entirely over yet, because, actually, the Empire doesn't entirely collapse after the kids are left to it. Mongols Podcast will return after this message. It loses a lot of things, but it doesn't completely lose its structure. But first, let's get to the Pure Muhammad, who is supposed to be in charge. Yeah, nobody agrees on him. So, Pure Muhammad is officially... So, Pure Muhammad is kicked out and killed. And... Basically, it's like civil war for like the next few years, and Timur's probably rolling in his grave, and I'm just and he's like, I wanted a stable empire, not this. Well, congratulations. That's what happens when you leave your empire with way too many kids, too many cooks in the kitchen. And finally, after all that bloodshed, his youngest son, uh, Shah Rukh, finally comes on top and officially makes himself in charge of whatever's left of the Timur and Empire. By this point, they've actually lost a couple cities in the wake of the Civil War, like Baghdad, and, and basically all modern-day Iraq. Uh, they're still bordering the, the Iraq stuff, but they've lost cities, essentially. But, and Rook's like, maybe my... Maybe all this Civil War and conquesting that my relatives have been doing is kind of bad. Maybe I should just... You know, stabilize things. And he actually rules right the next, like, um, you know, 42 years, and uh, nothing actually goes wrong with him. Oh. So it's, sometimes you just have to appreciate 42 years of stability. That just doesn't always come very often, doesn't last very long. And the Empire is actually doing kind of semi well. But. Of course, Shah Rukh didn't completely learn from history. He left the empire to the kids again. And, well, yes, he set up another guy in charge, and this other guy in charge was pretty smart, like, elite mathematician and stuff, but... But apparently he wasn't too interested in ruling the empire. 
And so that and so his grandkid decided to be a tyrant to take over everything and kill his brilliant mathematician daddy. If you're wondering, his brutality count means that he won't be lasting for long either. Ooh. Like, he literally just lasts six months. Wow. So, yeah. So, yeah, everything is just going held, uh, held to a handbasket with the Team Bird Empire. Yeah, jeez. And it's just basically civil war for the next 50 years. And since all the kids are fighting over who gets what, nobody's paying attention to the people. And then, suddenly out of nowhere, there's somebody who does. And he's not related to Genghis Khan, he's not related to Muhammad, he's not related to uh, Timur, and he's like, I want to be in charge of Persia, but there's the Timurids. Alrighty then, I'll just take care of the Timurids. Say what? Wait, you want to give us stability without the Timurids? Yeah, I actually do. And this is all around like 1507. And this kid is actually about 14 years old. His name is Shah Ismail, so talk about starting young. Yeah. Don't worry, he's actually going to do a really killer job, mainly in throwing out the Timurids. Wait, what? So the Timurids, the so Timurids are all getting thrown out because they, they've been spending too much time fighting each other and not enough time dealing with this new rebellion under Shah Ismail. And... And he take, and Shah's now basically kicks everybody out and kills all the Timurids, and he's like, yeah, yeah, I'm going to have this new empire thing, and what am I going to call it? The Safavids. And, well, so that's the end of the Mongols in Persia. Bye. But not everything's over yet, because you see, not all the Timurids die. Of course not. <laughs> of course not. And so, and there's actually one descendant that sort of and police manages to save everything and move somewhere else. And this kid's name happens to be Babu. And he's in charge of a small kingdom called Fergana. And he was involved a little bit in the various struggles to hold on to and to hold on to whatever territory they had in the whole team or civil wars. And he and even after Shazmail kicks him out of Fergana, he tries to take it back a couple of times. This is basically just in, like, northern Afghanistan. And But after a good few failed attempts, he's like, you know, I really can't beat the Persians. I, can't, I really can't beat the Persians. I'm just running myself dry here. I need to go somewhere else. And, uh, and Bob Ward decides to take a look down south, and he's like, Hey, what's the situation with India, messenger? It's a total mess. Uh, but it is always a mess. But it's extra messy now. Oh, great, I'm going to conquer that. Wait, what? I mean, cool and all, but... Yeah. So Bob Orr goes down there with his guns and horses, and, he, and he's like, Hey, you guys want some stability and not this really crappy Sultan, uh, sultan from Delhi? And the, the Sultan from Delhi is like, No, but I'm in charge here. I do. Don't kick me out of my job. And so they... And, and, and so the, uh, the Sultan of Delhi and Bob were meet in battle. And it's, again, elephants v. horse archers and cannons. But Bob Ward does not send in any flaming camels, so no flaming camels are being harmed, which is good. But the elephants are still getting shot to pieces. Because Bob Orr actually did a little bit of homework on gunpowder. Beyond what Timur was doing. And was like, hey, here's all my, my cannons. Oh, you sent elephants? Let's scare the absolute ever-living heck out of them. Here's a cannon. So the elephants are like, uh, we're not running into cannons. We're not. We're just running back. This is animal cruelty. I know. There's a lot of animal cruelty over here. <laughs> First we're sending camels on fire, and now we're just shooting elephants with cannons. That... How rude. How I'm offended. I'm offended. How rude. Leave the poor animals alone. But they're with the enemy army. Quit, uh, quit invading places. Just to everybody.
everybody. Just stop invading places. If you're unhappy with what's around you, then just fucking, I don't know, deal with it. And don't harm animals. <laughs> don't harm animals. <laughs> Bob, we're still not listening. He shot up all the elephants, and now the uh, and now the remaining elephants are all running back into the Indian line and causing lots of panic. God, I'll shoot him. <laughs> oh, don't worry. Alcoholism is going to take him. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So like, after he wins this, after he wins the battle and takes over Delhi, he actually he actually hands India some major stability, and he's like, "What am I going to call this?" Well, the Indians can't pronounce M Mongol, right? So we'll just call it Mughal. So that leads to the Mughal Dynasty of India, and that's going to run for like the next two hundred years. So I guess here's some stability, and Timur's descendants actually remain in and remain in charge of India for like a really long time. And the Mughals aren't actually deposed until about eighteen fifty seven, and they're deposed by the Brits because the British always had to ruin everything. Well, to be fair, the show is already ruined, but. The British had to do some extra stuff just to finish it. That's fake. <sighs> Idiots. I know, right? <laughs> so that's with Bob. <laughs> so that's with Bob. Bob, you basically finish up all, all the Timor stuff, but before we go, so there's some kind of major points on this. So all that brutality stuff and animal cruelty thing. Yeah, Timur is probably considered, like, one of the most brutal conquerors ever. Like, legitimately, he's got, like, a 17 million kill count in all his campaigns. That's at least the estimate we're going for. And to put this into perspective, um, that's about 5% of the world's population at this time. So it's just, like, every 20th person you know is gone. Because Timur decided he needed more land. Yeah, maybe just stick with the land you got, dude. But I want to be like Genghis. Genghis is my hero. <laughs> yeah, well, you evidently flopped. <laughs> well, to be fair, he did leave the Empire to the kids. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, what is up with that? Can we stop leaving the Empire yeah, to put Jillian kids and splitting up the inheritance? Do that. Don't do that. That's... Like, this is legitimately becoming a problem. You have to stop somewhere. Oh, becoming a problem? It's not becoming a problem. It, it is, is a problem. problem. It's actually been a problem since the 9th century. Why are we leaving oh empires God. to kids? I mean, just leave it to one. This is why the Ottomans just murdered all... The Ottoman sultans always murdered their siblings when they came to power, so they wouldn't have to deal with that kind of crap. See, now that makes sense. Like, that's stupid. Exactly. But that makes sense. <laughs> just winds up with a large bad account. That's what happens. <laughs> so, and also with that in mind, like, one of the other things that this empire did was, like, it's basically fusing, like, the Persian and Mongol, oh, Persian and Mongol cultures in the sense of, like, mostly the Mongols are just adopting the Persian culture. And that means... But that also means that the Persians are eating more rice because the Mongols brought that over from China. Good stuff. And so, yeah, they're going to do all that. And also, so I, the book here, Tamerlane, The Ultimate Warrior, love that book. Should go buy it. I'll probably leave an Amazon link to it somewhere. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Amazon because you can't get, like, like, look, well, I mean, y'all can't see it, because the walls are kind of here, but, like, that, it's a, that's a good book cover. Like, I love the, the font. So, with that in mind, I'm going to, we're going to kind of end it here, oh, okay. because the Timurid Empire is done, and, but, there is some good news, we're going to have another podcast, obviously, and, Ooh. well, as kind of a preview, I'm going to call this, um, when the girls have to save the rest of the cast, because this show is really messed up. Feminism. And yes. hey, it's all yes. real history here, so. We are don't not do this, so. out the stops. We are going full on with the ladies, because we love a lady who can do things. We, we, we love, we, we, we just love, we love, <laughs> we love. And, well, the ladies are going.
going to do some awesome stuff next episode, and actually the episode after that, too, so... Woo! Two whole episodes of, like, awesome females. Yeah, good stuff. And this has been Anna Shiaoich, Sam I.J. Morganster. Look for me wherever you can find me. And Robin. Bye. Just look for Miss Juvie. And that's the Marvel's Podcast. Bye. Woo!